Yeah, so the, the whole point of this panel is I, as, I, as I wire myself here, I'm going to let you do that here. Would you mind? The whole point of this, right, is, is, is to get to a point where you can use the venture capital money to run the company that you want in the way that you want. And you want to get, of course, as much money as possible to extend your runway as long as possible and give up as little equity as possible without getting too much of a valuation. That sounds simple. So um, I thought we'd sort of just kind of start with these companies and talk a little about what your company is, maybe talk about where you are uh, in whatever round you're in. Why don't we start right here? Hi, uh, my name is um, Eric Jennings. I'm the CEO of Filament. Yeah, try that. Yeah. My name is Eric Jennings. I'm the CEO of a company called Filament, and we're focused on, uh, within the Internet of Things space, specifically in the industrial uh, sector. Um, we have this big vision of decentralized systems with devices that can pay each other directly and kind of build a new economic model on top of what we see happening in the IoT space. And we just recently um, closed a, um, technically a post-seed round, but uh, it was on the paperwork of Series A um, with Bullpen uh, leading the round. How big round? Uh, Five million dollars. So, about $20 million? Uh, <laughs> sure, yeah, uh, 15. My name, is, my name is Drew Ewer, and I'm the CEO of HomeLights. Uh, HomeLight is the best new way to find a real estate agent. Uh, we have a proprietary algorithm that crunches through home sales data to objectively figure out which real estate agents are best in a given neighborhood based on their actual past performance. Um, and we raised a post-seed round uh, a little over a year ago um, from Bullpen. It was a $3 million round. Use both of these, Mike? Well, one of them was work with OK. Can you guys hear me OK? Yeah. Great. Uh, my name is Matt Strauss. I'm the founder and CEO of Namely. Namely is an HR platform for mid-sized companies. Founded the company about four years ago. Raised our post-seed round, I guess, about two years ago, two, two and a half years ago. Um, we have raised a total of $78 million. Uh, Sequoia led our last round, and I'm back in a rental car driving up and down Sand Hill Road, hopefully for the last time, uh, raising our last round of private financing right now, so uh, good timing for the discussion. Maybe I'll try that, okay. Can you hear me okay? Um, my name is Sunil Rajaraman. I'm the co-founder of scripted.com. Uh, we're a marketplace for businesses to hire freelance writers for content marketing. Uh, I'm currently an entrepreneur in residence at Foundation Capital, and financing history of the company, we raised a very traditional $1 million seed round, uh, a $4.5 million A and a $9 million B last year, and a few million in debt in between. Cool. Uh, is this on? Yeah. yeah All right. Um, hey, everyone. My name is Scott. I'm the CEO and uh, co-founder of a company called Classy out of San Diego. Um, we are building an operating system for a, the social impact organization, so nonprofits, schools, things like that. We started with a very simple peer-to-peer -peer fundraising product and have expanded ever since. Uh, we've been doing it for about four years. Uh, we basically bootstrapped the company for the first two and then raised a pretty large uh, angel round of about four to five million dollars, mainly from uh, San Diego, Boston, and random cities around the uh, country. We weren't quite networked into uh, the Bay Area at the, at the time, although I remember going up very unsuccessfully to Sand Hill Road in the beginning. <laughs> um, and then we eventually uh, found Bullpen Capital, uh, and we did sort of a bridge to RB, uh, which ended up being about $3 million. Salesforce Ventures participated uh, in Venture 51, and we m most recently closed uh, $18 million Series uh, B uh, with uh, Peter Thiel's new fund, uh, Mithril Capital, led that round. So let me start with you then. So the first time you go around, you go to Sand Hill Road, you say, I've got this great idea. And they say, wait, what? They say, who? What? What do you wish you knew then that you know now? Because you've been able to raise money from the likes of those guys now. Um, I want to get to leverage eventually, but, it, but just how do you figure out how to leverage the idea to get the attention that was mature enough to have a serious conversation? Yeah, so when we first went up and down uh, Sand Hill Road, I think that the biggest disconnect between then and you know, future rounds that we were successful in raising was uh, tightening up the narrative around the traction that we were seeing. So uh, problem, sorry. tightening up the narrative, the pitch around the traction that we were seeing. And, and because we were first time entrepreneurs, we we're from San Diego, um, and we really had never run a software company before. I, I believe it's pronounced San Diego. San Diego. It's yeah, German. Whales <laughs> behind. Um, and there is a story of why the company's called Classy that does relate to Anchorman. Um, 
But anyways, we were first-time entrepreneurs, and you know, we were kind of had an uphill battle and uh, pitching anything. It didn't matter how good our idea was. But not only that, we were we were coming in and saying, hey, we sort of cracked the nut on how to sell software to nonprofit organizations, which wasn't a sexy market at all at the time. So we had all these things, these hills to climb, um, and really traction. The traction, our nonprofit metrics, organizations like charities, like Salesforce. But, Salesforce Foundation, yeah. No, I mean Salesforce is also a nonprofit organization. That's a different story. <laughs> yeah. um, but uh, no, to that point, I mean, uh, I'm going to press you a little. Bit. When you say tighten the narrative, what do you mean? Like, so, what, what was? Because everyone wants their narrative to be tight, and everyone wants one less slide in the PowerPoint presentation. Right. What do you mean tighten? Well, I think it's it's it isn't easy to talk big vision and, and, and big picture, but that's sort of like a given. You need to know where you're going uh, directionally. But I think it's it's about looking at what traction you've seen in the last six months. What is the most impressive metric that you're trying to drive up and create the deck around that and show how you got from the first milestone to the second milestone, what you learned along the way, and create the whole, the whole deck around that and really dive into the weeds. And I think we were way too sort of high level. Uh, when we were so pitching. do you feel like what you were pitching, I'm gonna have you adjust the mic to push a little closer to your mouth, but yeah. uh, do you feel like what you were doing was telling the story of what they opportunity was and not telling the story of yourselves as entrepreneurs and saying we can get to there from here? Yeah, I think um, because we were in a challenging space uh, that wasn't immediately obvious that there was an economic opportunity, we had to use traction and the traction we were seeing as our best friend to basically prove to investors that this was an investment worthy sector. And so I don't think we did that enough. We should have relied more on the, the growth that we were seeing in the, in the weeds and really be able to unearth some of that growth data and make that the central point of the deck versus trying to convince them by losing. Versus trying to convince the investors on the space itself. Just said, hey, look, I don't care what you think about the space. Here's what we're seeing in the actual data. And not only is the space a big opportunity, but we're seeing growth metrics that rival the top SaaS companies in the country, if not the world. Maybe my word maturity is the right one. Does that resonate with you guys? Yeah, I mean, yeah, for us, I mean, we, we we had a similar problem up and down San Hill Road, and um, you know, nine out of ten say no. And we always joke, we just need to get the nine out of the way so we can get to the tenth. Right, and right. Um, and so as a number of Harry Wanamaker saying, right? I, I know that half my marketing budget is wasted. I just don't know which half. <laughs> exactly, right, right. But you know, we were in a weird spot because we um, we started our company on a different market. So we were focused on this kind of maker DIY enthusiast market, which is fine and great. It happens to make a terrible business case, but uh, it's a very important market. Um, and we were making hardware components. We started getting about interest from industrial customers wanting to use our kind of hobbyist product and platform to do things like collision avoidance on tractors on a mining work site. Like, it is not designed for that. That's Please not don't DIY, do that. Yes. No, yeah. Do not start a mine on your own. <laughs> exactly. So, so, you know, we had this weird spot where we were running out of money, but we had this huge opportunity kind of land in our lap. And it was very important for us to find the right investor, and it happened to be Bullpen, um, who understood that, right? Who understood that you, you started on a small, you know, local maxima, and now you found this larger maxima you can go after. After, and we realized that because the timing didn't line up and you were going after your thing with your seed round, um, a certain amount of capital will get you to that larger one. And um, it was surprisingly difficult to find investors who understood that concept um, of, you know, we started on one spot, we found another, and you think that would be common knowledge, but we actually found it different. And, and again, telling the story of your own success was part of that? Well, we're huge nerds because like, we, we like, live and breathe. Sorry, look at, look at the room where you can yeah, see. I, I assume we are all I'm among nerds. friends, I know. But it's a, <laughs> my, uh, we, we're, we're big advocates of decentralization when it comes to like, blockchain technologies and, and what Bitcoin has done to the, the currency world and what we think mesh networking does to the networking world. And so we leveraged that heavily within our narrative. And we found similar investors who resonated with that, and it seemed to pay off. Um, you were nodding as well. Yeah. Um, so, so for one, I, I feel like the uh, uh, just your traditional kind of Series A venture round is getting much larger. But along with that, the kind of the the milestones that you have to to achieve in order to to kind of get to that stage are, are also getting greater and greater. Because especially two or three years ago, you saw a ton of a ton of seed stage companies getting funded. And what I tell entrepreneurs is, is you know, you might think your business is really great and really amazing, but if you know just the uh, uh, venture investors, by a sheer you know law of numbers, only only invest in you know one to five percent of the deals that they see. And so, when you walk into that room with that investor, your business has to be more amazing than you know ninety five percent of the other businesses that they see. And if it's not, then you know there's no sense in even having a conversation. And so, the interesting thing about the the post seed round is it really lets you know companies kind of get to that point where they're able to to really shine and really kind of walk in with confidence into that. That large, you know, that conversation with the institutional investor about that larger round. 
Well, when you're in an entrepreneur residence position now, right? You've been to that. You've been to that point. We've gotten a company funded. You've gotten a company to the next level of funding. Now you're listening to more pitches than any of us, with any luck, will ever have to hear. Um, what do you see as the difference between a post seed pitch and a seed pitch, a successful one? Yeah, I mean, right, it, it, you've seen the five percent uh, part. You've already seen the winnowing. To enough, so you, you're, you've told an idea that's compelling enough to get a check, but how do you sell the company enough to get that post seed round? Watching, uh, I mean, just sitting into those first partner meetings as an EIR like several months ago, it was kind of, it was a surreal experience. <laughs> um, Did it make you mad? You know, it, it, doesn't, it didn't make me mad at all. It actually was, it was extremely enlightening. And what you learn about the way the venture mind works also is just, it's a lot more people driven than you think. So all of this stuff about narrative, it matters. You know, you could be executing better than anyone in the space. And I think that's a, a common mistake entrepreneurs make is, okay, well, my, my traction is amazing. I'm 2Xing or 3Xing. But, you know, venture, venture partners care a lot about, you know, the vision and the big picture and all of that. Uh, just because you're executing, it could mean that it's just really easy to execute in your market. It's not, you know, it's not necessarily a positive signal. Is that people or is that marketplace, right? Yeah, it's a, it's a combination of, of the two. It's, you know, you got to have a large enough market, you have to have some early traction, and you have to have a big vision. Mm -hmm. And between my seed and my A, so my seed was led by Crosslink Capital, it was all about the, the tactics. We were doing 20, 30K of revenue a month by the time we raised our seed. And then I had some trouble getting from seed to A. We raised our A from Redpoint eventually. We actually didn't do the post-seed so traditional. Had trouble, what, do you mean? what was that? You said you had trouble. What do you mean? Oh, yeah, because we focused... Uh, we, we focus too much on, on the tactics, on, on our traction, rather than changing the narrative to focus on, hey, here is the, the bigger picture, the vision. And we eventually were able to get there. And you know, thank goodness for Western like technology investment. Because what he was saying was, we, we had to prove, once we got, we, 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 we proved our idea, we needed to prove our execution. Sounds like you're saying the opposite. Is, is, is what you're saying that, that this, this the, the first round is prove the idea, the second round is prove that you're the one to do the idea? Yeah, I think both actually make sense. It depends on sort of the starting point of, of you coming into the room. So meaning, I mean, we had no institutional investors. We basically had a bunch of no-name sort of angel investors and we were first-time entrepreneurs. So uh, the traction was sort of our best friend in, in convincing um, folks that we actually could execute, even though it's our first companies. But I, but I would agree, you know, in, in this situation, that, that might make sense too. Yeah, just one, one thing I would add to all of this is for, for entrepreneurs and, in in, you know, looking for post-seed rounds or financing options, and I see so many people potentially screw this up, raise venture debt. It's a good financing option, and it's basically, like, free right now. That asset class is so underappreciated, but the extra, you know, six to 12 months it can get you can get you to the milestones where it takes to get a traditional A or B. Go to Silicon Valley Bank, CNB, whatever, but... As soon as you raise an equity round, get venture debt in place, like right away, get a venture debt line. Why? Because the pitch is so hot? It's, when you're fully funded, you're, 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 you have a lot of capital, you will get low rates, you will get long interest only periods. It's basically like, it's basically like free capital. Um, and that, that asset class is so competitive. Um, and, Do you uh, feel like you're extending runway even at that stage? You, you can extend your runway for basically no dilution and you know, very few warrants attached to the debt, and it will get you to that next milestone. But as soon as you raise an equity round, just call up SVB or CNB, both are great partners. Now, Matt, I want to ask you uh, uh, about leverage, because there's a point at which in a conversation, you can say to Paul Martino or some other knucklehead venture capital, say, uh-uh, no, 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 those are not the terms I'm going with. I'm walking out the door, I mean it this time. And, and, I, and I wonder, like, how do you get to that point in that conversation? And what's the right point to do that when you've got a growing company? Well, I think the first, you know, your first job as a founder, and it's the most important job, is never let the company run out of money. So you've got to pretty much consign yourself to the fact that for every day that you're in that job till the end of time, your job is to raise money. And I don't think there's been a day in the last four years where I haven't thought about raising more money and how we're going to raise more money, even the day after our $45 million round this spring. Um, always be raising, um, whether that's having coffee or making relationships or really pressuring your current investors to make new introductions for you. Your, your investors, they're done with you once they've made their, their major investment. Their entire job is to help you raise more money. Um, 
So the way that you get that leverage is to prove that you can raise money. And you have to prove that you can raise money and more money at a higher valuation, at 2x valuation your last round, every single time very David Mamet, very Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross. Right? Yep, you have to always be raising. That is, that is your job as a founder. And if you think it's anything else, if you think that your number one priority is anything else than that, you're deluding yourselves. Well, I mean, shouldn't the ultimate goal to have a free cash flowing business so you don't have to always be raising money? I mean, you know. Yeah, and the, the only... The only reason that why that's important is because in later rounds, that's why people continue to give you money, is they think that someday you'll be able to build a profitable business. But I guess, how does this story change? Like, How does this story go from, I'm, I've got a great idea, to I'm a, great, I'm a great leader with a great idea, or a great business person with a great idea, to my idea is so good, you need to be in this round. Like, at what point do you change that conversation from... So, so, Please go out with me or to I would never go out with someone like you. So it changed, it changed for me in Series B. It was the first round ever where we got multiple term sheets. Up until then, whether it was Paul or anybody else that came along, um, we couldn't tell Paul to fuck off, right? We needed Paul's money. We needed everybody's money. Um, so we would never do that. I couldn't tell him to fuck off either. No. But, just but, the, one, but the, one, the one thing I thought would happen is that all those people who said, us, said no to us, and there were dozens and dozens of firms who said no to us along the way, I thought by now I would feel like vengeance is mine, um, they're gonna regret with passing up on us, and I'm gonna make them pay. But that feeling actually goes away, and it actually feels pretty shitty to have to tell VCs who you've gotten to know over a two year period that you're not gonna take their money. Um, I, I thought it would be the most awesome feeling in the world, and it's actually turned out to be uh, maybe it's because I'm a nice person, but it actually turned out to be a bad call. Like when you have to call them and say no to them, I finally understand what they feel like when they have to, when they had to say no to me a couple of years ago. Do you feel like uh, with the, that your, the story of your company, like what was the story of your company when you were raising your Series A and how would you describe it? What's your, what's your, what was your elevator pitch then and what is it now? Sure, so I was an ad guy. I had done two ad tech startups and both had exited. Decent returns, probably singles or doubles for those investors. Um, I had to switch industries in New York City and convince people that I could build a software company with absolutely no software company experience. And it was a real uphill battle. It was horrible. Um, we got so told not, uh, probably nine times out of ten no. The one time we almost got a yes, it happened to be um, with Greylock, and, and Anil happened to be a partner and happened to be running Workday, so that, was def that turned into a no. Mm -hmm. So it was a very, very difficult experience the first couple of years. It, uh, you know, definitely, we almost ran out of money. If Paul didn't give us money, we would have run out of money for sure. Um, I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for, for Lear Ventures and Bullpen Capital um, doing our post-seed round. And we almost ran, we had six, six weeks of payroll left. We were still hiring people um, right before our Series A. So we, we nearly ran out of money multiple times those first couple of years. And, and how is the story different now? Like that, that wasn't your story, you're raising money. We need it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, now I can be a little bit choosier, but there's still stress. Yeah, I've got to find somebody to lead the next round, right? So there's maybe five to ten firms that are interested, but I've got to find the, the firm that's right and I'm going to be a good partner and want to be you know, on this journey for the next three or four years. Drew, how do you approach this notion of dilution when you're in that post-seed round, when there's all kinds of opportunities, uh, as difficult as they are to come by, that they can be structured in any conceivable way? Uh, yeah, well... So in terms of dilution, um, and also to the, the always um, be thinking about how you're going to raise your next round, um, I think that in general, it, you know, as an entrepreneur, um, my advice is just to not be concerned about dilution, right? To, to, to go for the round. Really? Yeah. Um, yep. it, basically, meaning raise as much money as is reasonable at the time that, that when you're actually raising, because fundraising is so incredibly distracting for a business because mm -hmm. you know it can take a long time if you're not if your business isn't in the right place at the at the right time that it's it's much better to take a little bit of dilution now and have more capital in the bank to actually go and execute mm -hmm. on on what you need um, to, to do going forward it's also um, typically I think oftentimes entrepreneurs like um, uh, get you know, haggle over price incessantly, but but the rest of the terms of the deal kind of get forgotten. And a lot of those, um, and, and the type of, of investor and the quality of investor also kind of gets, kind of goes by the wayside. And I, th I think that, that all of the other kind of um, less tangible <coughs> aspects of the round can be just as important as the price. Well, and we've seen, I mean, some of the savviest, best-name investors are the very ones who can 
wrangle mm -hmm. certain terms that will uh, greatly benefit them to the deterioration. I mean, we saw this with, with the, I think we saw with the price of the, the Square IPO, mm -hmm. where you had you know the biggest investor in this in their Series E round at fifteen dollars and forty six cents was the same company that decided to price the stock in the hole, mm -hmm. issue more shares themselves at nine dollars. Goldman Sachs was the biggest holder at, at, at biggest known owner of the the fifteen forty six shares, they priced in the hole at, at, at nine dollars, the stock is still trading at thirteen and they had a forty five percent return on mm -hmm. their underwater investment. Mm -hmm. So getting those big names doesn't always mean that I mean are, 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 the, what what term what what's the most odious term that you rejected? Ah, uh, wow. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I think that there, um, that the way that, that um, uh, just like that preference is an, is an important term, board structure, um, you know, and especially early on with, with seed deals, um, you know, seed deals are typically pretty flexible. Um, and so kind of just the, the, the right to sell the company and, and, and whatnot um, are, are terms that, that, are <coughs> that are traditionally pretty important in seed that kind of um, are, are become less standard, um, you know, going forward. Are you seeing that as well? Less standard, uh, uh less standard terms. You mean? Yeah. Um, no, not too much. You know, we. I mean, I always go back to Brad Feld's book around. It's all about either control or economics, right? Those are the two levers you have in, in fundraising. And um, we're very interested in in maintaining more control and less interested about the economic side. So I, I completely agree with what others have said around. Don't optimize on dilution. It's a it's a distraction. Um, it's it's not the most important thing in your company, right? So. Um, so we actually were finding more issue with people wanting board seats when they probably shouldn't have them or they didn't bring much to the table. Um, that was part of the terms that some of them wanted to have. We declined. Um, we also took a couple strategic investors, which was an interesting process because they, they have a very bad reputation about slowing things down. You know, big, big venture arm of a big, you know, multinational corporation wanting to invest in your company um, can actually be distracting in of itself because they can crush you with just their red tape. And so. Um, we had to be very careful and did a lot of it. Red tape in terms of taking the money or red tape after they're in the door both, with the money? Both. Yeah. I mean, so the, the traditional issues with them is they want exclusivity on things, which is obviously a no-go for us. But um, even things like it took them the longest to even just wire the money, just this stupid stuff that you think, you know, you expect VCs typically move quite fast. Once everything's done, you can move it in a few weeks. This was several months. Um, so you just have to expect that. But um, the two we, we went with were very, very good, and I think it's the minority. So it's just, again, knowing what you're going into and understanding what the terms are coming around to be. I, I got to hear the classy story. Of what's terms? The, what's the no, worst what's term? The Ron Burgundy. Or, or if you, I, I oh. love your worst terms, but... Well, the company actually started um, 10 years ago, and it was more just a, 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 a pet project. We were well, fundraising. Sorry, I mean, I should, did you get worse? I should start with worse terms, and I can hear classy. I'll go to worst terms after because it actually fits into the story. Perfect. Um, so we started just by fundraising for the American Cancer Society because my mom and my roommate's uh, mom had had cancer growing up. And uh, it actually started with a bar crawl, getting our friends together and raising money with cash. And over the course of the next four years, we basically did tons of different fundraising events, walks, races, runs, concerts, all sorts of stuff, bringing millennials together, helping them fund certain tangible projects in the community. Uh, and we actually, Classy was born out of the need for our own fundraising events uh, in, the, in the community in San Diego. Um, but in that first event that we were uh, contemplating, the pub crawl, the movie uh, Anchorman happened to be on in the background and he said the catchphrase, you stay classy San Diego. And um, my roommate Pete said, yeah, well, why don't we call this pub crawl the stay classy pub crawl, never <laughs> thinking it would actually turn into a legitimate company. And so about five years later, uh, those events turned into the opportunity that we basically started in about so January 2011. So literally stay classy. Yeah, we actually dropped the stay uh, a year and a half ago, right when we were raising the B round to try to lose the uh, you know, com complete connection to Ron Burgundy, but also sort of have it part of the culture. Um, so we're, act we're, we're actually gl really glad we didn't totally change the name, keep it. Um, we've been able to sort of redefine what classy means within the space, so. And how does that lead to odious terms? Um, well, we actually had a, a term sheet blow up in our face um, when we were trying to raise that Series A initially. And the reason why we went with All Angels is um, this term sheet fell through and we had signed it. There was a breakup fee and everything. And what happened was, um, since it's kind of non-binding, the, the, the VC, and it was, I won't name any names, but it was like sort of a, a, a tier of three. We were sort of desperate, let's just say. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, they started changing the terms uh, between, you know, in the, in the due diligence period. They'd come back to us and say, hey, well, you know, um, your quarter wasn't exactly what you had said. And it was off by, you know, 5%, like nothing big. 
Um, and so they, they came back with a slightly lower a suggestion for a slightly lower valuation. Then they wanted to ratchet up the liquidation preference. And the real killer was, and we were this desperate, so we were like okay with all that stuff because I agree we weren't about to you know fight uh, a little bit here and there on the valuation. Uh, we were really strict on the board seat. That was the one thing that we kind of held in check. Uh, but we had created this, the one event we kept was this thing called the Class Awards, which is the, now the largest philanthropy award show for nonprofits, like the Oscars. And that was sort of our big marketing endeavor in the beginning. And they put us on a phone with this guy in Canada who owned a bunch of conferences and award shows and stuff. And what came obvious about halfway through the call is they had had a side conversation to basically sell off the Class Awards without talking to us. This was in the middle of due diligence. So really bad move on their part. I don't think they thought we had the balls to basically break up. Uh, we, me and my co-founder basically, after that call, we hung up, we looked at each other, we said, we're out. We had no money in the bank. We had no way of basically, you know, resurrecting the situation. But we're like, we will not sell our soul to the devil to these so guys. kept the classy awards and stayed classy. Kept the classy awards, broke the terms, ended up getting in this negotiation. We barely had to pay the breakup fee uh, because they violated a few things here and there. So our lawyers were actually good with that. But um, we were kind of going downhill and all of a sudden, I don't know if anyone's ever heard of this campaign called Coney 2012 by Invisible Children. It was yeah. the largest viral video of all time. Well, uh, they put our donation button or uh, link on the end of that video and that the, the fees from that campaign they raised about four million in 30 days saved the company nice. over the next two to three weeks and then we were able to raise 500,000 more in angel and we just kept kind of going from there mm -hmm. um, so it was almost lights out uh, for us and we All barely fidelity to Ron Burgundy yeah, and it was actually real <laughs> revenue that saved the company, <laughs> which is, you know, I always thought it would be an angel investor what or something, but uh, yeah, yeah. Some real revenue. That, some people think Anchorman's a comedy, too. Yeah. Um, thank you, guys. Terrific stories. Appreciate it. This, this is whoever all the entrepreneurs want to be. You want to get to this level, so glad to hear you did it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.